How's it going, Dr. Barnes? Uh, doing great. How are you, Patrick? I'm good. Should I call you dad or Dr. Barnes during this? I think for our purposes tonight, dad should work fine. <laughs> okay, I'll call you dad. Dr. Right. Dad. Um, so what we're here to do is talk about, this is session, we call this chat session one of yep. hopefully a couple that uh, are going to delve into the world of trauma-informed legal practice. Yes, and all the different aspects that that, that can impact uh, lawyers and law firms and the, the legal practice as a whole. Mm-hmm. And so, basically, what what you know what, where we came up with this idea was you and I were sitting and talking one day. Um, you are in the the the, um, the psychology field. You're a PhD. And uh, you've spent a lot of your career working on compassion fatigue and various different professions. Um, Mm -hmm. And we were kind of talking about that. What does that mean? Uh, You know, what does that look like? Who's affected by that? What do you do about it? And as we were talking, I, you know, kind of started to apply that in my head to what I do, which is I'm a trial lawyer and uh, I've been doing personal injury basically my whole career. And I kind of saw a lot of overlap um, in that the, the professions that you help and, and what that looks like for those helping professionals look a lot like what maybe a lawyer, especially ones that deal with traumatized clients, might see um, in, their, in their career. And so we started saying, okay, well, let's apply this to, to the legal profession. And, um, you know, there are a lot of people out there doing this and they're applying it, you know, the kind of the broad term is trauma informed legal practice. Um, but there's a lot of people out there that are applying it to different niches of, of the legal sure. profession. There's a group in Canada or several people in Canada that are applying it a lot to like um, victim advo- ad- advocacy, um, yes. not, not re-traumatizing um, victims through the legal process. Um, you know, in the criminal system, the family law system. Um, and so they're kind of focusing on um, trauma, compassion fatigue in that sense, in, the, in that the legal profession needs to evolve to not traumatize uh, the victims so much. And I think you and I are saying, okay, that's fantastic that that's happening and any other aspect that it's being applied to, but what we're applying it to is the actual practitioners. Mm-hmm. And the organizations within, you know, that the practitioners are within um, because you need to be trauma informed and you need to be, um, you know, you need to be able to, to equip yourself with the tools to, to, I guess, be okay in this system. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I, you know, we would have our conversations and you would really just talk about some of the struggles and some of the like difficult kind of um, personality kind of characteristics she'd be working with. And it struck me how similar, you know, the, the work and the people that you work with are to the people that we work with and, and particularly the traumatized clients that we work with. And um, so um, I, compassion fatigue is really something that kind of emerged out of nursing where they really began to look at what is the cost of caring about people in a medical environment um, where there's so much kind of exhaustion and burnout, but there's also so much trauma that's being dealt with. And no one had looked at that until uh, kind of the early 90s. And, um, you know, we started looking at, I started thinking, well, you're as much a helping professional as I am. And so the, why would the things that we are looking at in order to kind of reduce turnover and to help people stay in their professions and uh, work satisfaction and those kinds of things. And I, and I thought, wow, it's really interesting. Do you, is there such a thing as trauma informed legal practice? And I wasn't aware of anything like that at the time. Now we look and see that there are these pockets all over the world, actually in Australia, right. New Zealand. And, yeah. Um, throughout the United States, mm-hmm. and, Canada. And law schools, the, the other group that's, So we're, you know, I think the Canadian group is really looking at how the legal process re-traumatizes traumatized clients and that, you know, we can talk about trauma and trauma symptoms and Mm -hmm. how that actually makes it um, um, more damaging to the client, but it also interferes with the positive outcomes in helping that person because 
and, and you can speak much more to the depositions and the stressors mm -hmm. that, that individuals go through, uh, we're really looking at the kind of the secondary trauma or vicarious trauma of lawyers mm -hmm. who are working with traumatized clients every day. And we see that in our world. Um, you know, I, I work in a very small private addiction treatment center and we're focusing on that all the time. So today, the point of this session is basically to get down the, the basics um, terminology that we will use throughout um, our conversations about trauma-informed legal practice, which again is kind of the broad term for a bunch of different subsections of, of, of trauma and the legal practice involved in trauma, not just the legal practice, but all trauma-informed care. Um, so we're just going to kind of go through the basics today, apply it to the profession, and then as we go through these sessions, get a little more in detail um, you know, with each little, little area of it. So, um, I guess the first one we keep using the word is trauma. What, what, what is trauma? Well, I think that, I mean, before, that's a great question. Before I answer it, it's, it's, um, it's not what people think. People think the event is the trauma and the event is a, uh, a situation that is often outside the realm of normal experience or something that is um, kind of life-threatening or has the potential to be life-threatening. But the trauma is really our response to it. And so um, our brain um, has you know, three primary um, areas and uh, the prefrontal cortex in the front of our brain where reason is, where memory is. Uh, we have the brain stem in the back that controls the involuntary process. And then in our midbrain is called the limbic system. The limbic system is really a process, it's kind of a computer system that monitors um, what's going on in the body and turns things on and turns things off, kidneys and you know, virtually every system has. But one of its jobs is to assess our environment and um, how dangerous it is. And when things are, are really terrifying or um, incredibly powerless uh, that have the potential to be um, life-threatening or life-threatening in terms of, um, and not just to us, but like witnessing it or it happening to someone that we love. So hearing um, about it, hearing about a loved one that can be traumatizing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and the one that's really interesting, and we've just added it to our diagnostic manual, and we've added it for first responders, but I think it's particularly um, uh, appropriate for lawyers is um, anyone whose job um, presents them with uh, an almost constant uh, review of traumatic material. Mm -hmm. And so police officers, uh, first responders, coroners, uh, coroners. Um, but, we, you know, we talked about it, like, you know, uh, attorneys um, in preparation for trial mm -hmm. um, see the same pictures over and over. Mm -hmm. um, personal injury attorneys uh, read reports of clients that they've begun to care, you know, they care about and realize what they've been through and kind of see the anxiety and the, the hypervigilance and the need to control that those clients uh, maintain. Um, and so um, I think attorneys are helping professionals, just like therapists, doctors, everyone else. And um, that they're far more inundated with traumatic, the potential for traumatic material um, than they give it any credit for. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Themselves. I mean, examples of personal injury attorneys dealing with, you know, severe car wrecks, seeing photographs of injuries of, of accident scenes, um, you know, medical malpractice, uh, uh, you know, DAs, prosecutors, uh, public defenders looking at cr criminal crime scenes and you know photographs of um you know batteries and murders and that kind of thing um family law lawyers talking about trauma um you know of spouses or family members you know right. there's there's and those are those are daily occurrences right for for attorneys and so being inundated i guess that would be that category right but trauma also for 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 clients having gone through that trauma Right. And so what they're, one of the reasons they're coming to someone like me, a personal injury attorney, is because they've been through a car wreck or, uh, you know, some sort of negligence or harm done to them that likely was based on trauma. 
Yeah, it's interesting. You know, the research would tell us that the people who are most susceptible to compassion fatigue are people who have had their own traumas. And so that idea of if I was in a car accident with pretty severe injuries and I'm an attorney and I'm working with a client who comes in and tells me a story that's very similar to my story, the brain doesn't really know the difference between the past and the present as it's processing that information. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes we can become, and I've experienced this as a therapist, we can be triggered by the story that they're telling us and that we may not even um, recognize it until much later. And the other group that I want to talk, uh, mention is judges. Mm -hmm. You know, people who sit in chambers all day, yeah. watching uh, evidentiary information um, mm -hmm. that shows the car accident or shows the murder scene. And um, here's testimony. And, yeah. Well, and and not just judges, but, you know, bailiffs and um, clerks and yeah. um, court reporters. It's, it, I guess we should say that we're dealing with the trauma-informed legal practice. We talk a lot about attorneys, but it, this is broad reaching. This is paralegals. This is sec secretaries. This is intake specialists. This is anybody in the yeah. legal profession that, that deals, in, deals with tra traumatized clients. And so, yeah, absolutely. I, I was struck by a statistic, which we, we cited in one of the papers we wrote, which is about from the National Center for PTSD, that this is not like a, 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 like a, a rare, rare occurrence, right? This says that it said that 61% of men and 51% of women report having experienced at least one traumatic, traumatic event in their lifetime. But only 8% of these victims are actually diagnosed with PTSD. So while some people are diagnosed PTSD, a lot of people, I mean, more than half of people have had a traumatic experience. And so, you know, we are a traumatized society in some sense. Well, what even takes that statistic into a more meaningful uh, thing is that um, I think 8% of um, men and 10 or 8% of women and 10% of men have experienced four or more major traumatic injuries. And when we look at, um, there's a lot of research in adverse childhood events, like uh, kids that grow up in families with addiction, kids who grow up in families with mental health issues, um, criminality, people who've been arrested, um, physical, emotional, sexual abuse, uh, neglect, um, uh, arguing parents, fighting, you know, domestic violence. That, um, that they estimate that 14% a, a, a pretty significant study that 14% of middle-class Americans have four or more of those events in childhood. And so they may say, well, I've never been traumatized because I didn't get hit by a car. I didn't get, right. uh, you know, abused. In that yeah, way. I've never been assaulted or something like that. But just growing up in that environment mm -hmm. creates the same impact in the limbic system mm -hmm. of that hypervigilance so I think the two, the, the two symptoms I didn't really uh, talk about was people who are really traumatized are really hypervigilant, meaning their, their brain begins to see things as more dangerous than they actually are around them, or maybe there really is that dangerous around them. Mm -hmm. And so they're always looking for any kind of threat. And so the, the other is this need to control. And so if things aren't going the way they like it, they get angry faster or they withdraw and and don't participate or don't cooperate and you can begin to see how difficult that would be for someone who comes into your law practice and who they're in a brand new environment mm -hmm. um, you're asking them to relive the story that that caused the trauma for them mm -hmm. um, i mean even from the first time you call a law firm and just not you know not through any fault of the law firm, but that's just how the system set up. You call for to talk to a lawyer and people want to know what, why you're calling. Right. And so immediately you're being asked to tell the story. And if you're, if you're struggling with that emotional arousal, that hypervigilance, that exaggerated startle response um, right off the bat, you're already uh, you got your guard up and, and the law firm's not doing much to, to, to help you get that guard down because um, that's, that's what it is. Well, you call a law firm and what's the, what's the situation you need to talk to a lawyer about? 
next step would be an intake, which pre COVID would have been likely in, in office. You come into an office you've never been to, you're unfamiliar with it. And now you're telling that story again in person with someone you've probably never met before. So, and I'm not saying that that's wrong. That's how the legal system has always been. What I'm, what you and I are saying is as we get through this trauma informed practice, and get through these different things and understanding and being looking out for those and understanding that it's probably happening more often than you think to be informed is the way you change your energy. It's the way you change your approach when you meet those clients and you, you change that connection with the client immediately and look at it from a completely different light than this is just, we need to get in, we need to get into this meeting, learn all the facts to make a legal conclusion and then tell them what we know and decide if they're going to be our client or not. It's got to be, it's got to be more connected than that because likely based on that study, 61% and 51% for men and 61% for women, you're dealing with a, with a traumatized individual. And, and if you're doing trial work, personal injury work, um, or any of the other ones we've talked about, um, you know, you're dealing with someone that's come to you directly because of a trauma. Absolutely. And, and you can, you know, speak much more to the, to the kind of the process that happens in that, yeah. that law firm. But, um, you know, one of the things that I, um, I've published on is uh, the, the clients are, traumatized clients are assessing us way more than we're assessing them. Mm -hmm. And so while we're kind of paying as a mental health professional, I'm assessing them trying to find out how best to help them. But they're looking at everything, that um, upwards to 95%, 93% of all communication is nonverbal. Mm -hmm. So if I'm looking at my watch, I've got another um, uh, intake to take, I'm you know, uh, busy, I'm asking the same questions and not remembering answers. Mm -hmm. They're looking really- Looking at my computer or my questionnaire. They've already seen you as not safe. Mm -hmm. and, and that so guard often, goes up. Absolutely. I, I will often start my presentations by asking people, um, how many of you have ever worked with unmotivated clients? And oh, geez, all the hands go up. And, and um, uh, it started by uh, one of my students at the University of Colorado had asked me, um, well, what's the best way to work with an unmotivated client? And I said, um, I've never worked with an unmotivated client. And of course, the whole room laughs. And, and I said, most of my clients are pretty highly motivated to stay the same. Mm -hmm. And I said, I work with trauma and my clients are really highly motivated to stay safe. Mm -hmm. and that process of staying safe with that hypervigilance and that control may look really unmotivated. Mm -hmm. And for people who don't, aren't able to make that leap to, no, 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 they're really motivated and it's my job to kind of join with them and figure out how to help them move. Uh, because once I see them as unmotivated, they can see that I see that. And mm -hmm. we're, we're now at odds. So, you know, the kind of the, the symptoms of, of direct primary trauma, a, a mental um, memory issues, right? Because of the prefrontal cortex, um, emotional arousal, hypervigilance, exaggerated startle response. Um, uncomfortability, right? That, that well, how will they present as a witness, right? And, and you're kind of si you're kind of trying to figure out them as a as a potential client, as a witness. If this were to go to trial, that they may very well be in fight or flight simply because they're in your office talking about a trauma, and you're judging their behavior of well, they seemed a little un uncertain on shaky grounds, and are they an accurate historian? Those are all words that attorneys use. And the reality is they might be full, full blown reliving that trauma and seeing these symptoms, avoidance behavior, right? If, and that's a big one to me. If, if you have a hard time getting your client on the phone, you think, wow, they're just, they don't want to, they don't want to put in the work or they don't want to talk to talk to their attorney. They may very well see you call on the caller ID and immediately go into fight or flight, right? Because that's an avoidance behavior. I, I, I don't have, they're maybe not be emotionally equipped to have that conversation with you when you're just doing your checklist. I need to call this client and get a, an update from them. 20, you know, 21 day, 30 day update. They may see you on the caller ID and send them into a completely different emotional uh, or energetic space than, than you are just calling to see how they're doing. And so again, to not to sound like a broken record, but the more you can be informed on what the trauma symptoms look like, the more you can empathize with your clients and think, 
from day one, from moment one, we need to establish different grounds with our clients, especially ones that we believe have been traumatized. And then the other one is negative alterations in cognition and moods, persistent distorted blame of others. Um, you know, basically like, or, or consequences of the, of the traumatic event, right. And blowing things out of proportion. Um, uh, you know, I, I just, I think that all of those symptoms are probably something attorneys have seen uh, more yeah. often than not. Yeah. There's always, there's always a perfectly logical reason for what's happening. Right. And it may not, uh, um, it may not seem logical to us, but um, you know, we use a test called the trauma symptom inventory and it's a pretty extensive test. And one of the, one of the kind of reliability scales kind of looks at sometimes people exaggerate how bad things are um, that looks unreliable, but it, it just is an indication of how dangerous they see their world. Mm-hmm. So we can say, Oh, that's kind of crazy. You know, that, but that that's more than is possible. Mm-hmm. But in their mind, the way they see the world, they may really see the world that dangerous. And, um, and we're just part of that outside world. We're not really part of theirs. The other thing that I'll, I'll say is um, for, for attorneys who work with, um, you know, things that happen to kids, mm-hmm. like my area of expertise, my, my research has been in the secondary trauma of parents of kids who have um, experienced severe medical injuries that required like intensive care treatment. Mm -hmm. And what we found was how traumatized the parents are Mm -hmm. after these events. And so if we just go through that list of symptoms with memory issues and sort of emotional dysregulation and hypervigilance and control that sometimes parents can, can be seem really unreasonable or really difficult to deal with. Mm-hmm. And that um, we think, well, they're not the one that got hit by the car. Right. Well, but they've had to deal with the consequences of that. Mm-hmm. Well, that well, would fit fit squarely in the persistent distortion of blame of themselves or of others. Absolutely. You know, I, I am out to seek vengeance on, on those who have been negligent towards my, my kid. Right. Or maybe, you know, so, yeah, I mean, the, all those symptoms are so, are so important. Let, let's, you know, so being able to, and I think, you know, as we go through these sessions, we'll talk more about trauma and you'll, we'll see more examples of it and how that, how that applies and, you know, and kind of examples that we come up with, but you know, the term that we're, the other aspect of the, of the trauma informed legal practice is compassion fatigue. And that's on the actual practitioner and the team, right? The, the, the firm. And that's comprised of two, you know, basic foundational blocks, which we need to go over it's a combination of secondary trauma and burnout. Right. Right. Both are distinct, although they kind of are similar and we'll get into the continuum and uh, the infinity sign, which is that they are all kind of playing off of each other, but exactly. And so secondary trauma is um, what's a good working definition of secondary trauma. Um, That if we interact with traumatized people over the course of time, and we care about those individuals while we're working with them, that our desire to be helpful and um, our um, um, compassion, the difference between empathy and compassion is empathy is the ability to sort of co-experience emotions without someone having to tell us that we can, that we can um, be supportive and experience the sadness that they're experiencing but that we know where we end and they begin and that it's, it's theirs. We can have empathy for it, but we can still be okay. And compassion is empathy with a desire or a belief that we can do something about it. Mm. And so um, mm. when we look at secondary trauma, that compassion, that ability to help someone when the court system may be really slow. Mm-hmm. And um, so Secondary trauma is what we would call vicarious trauma, which is like an infectious trauma that we spend time with them, we care about them, their pain begins to be experienced. We begin to experience their pain as if it was ours. And so we have the same symptoms, memory issues, hyperarousal, hypervigilance, re-experiencing, um, um, avoidance of important 
people and places in our lives. But there's also a secondary trauma that we call chiasmal. And chiasmal is that um, um, the trauma of one person can actually re-traumatize a, a whole organization. Hmm. So like one bad event that is pretty traumatic could, or, or could end up traumatizing a whole uh, law firm. Mm-hmm. And I've, I've seen it with counseling centers. I've seen it with hospitals. I've seen it um, in um, um, oncology units where I've been called in to consult where one death caused the trauma of the police officer. Uh, Chiasmal came out of a study of the Cleveland Police Department back in the 70s. And so um, it's, it's, it's our experiencing trauma associated with interacting with traumatized people. So, I mean, trying to synthesize that a little bit. So empathy is basically the ability to, to step in someone else's shoes, but also step right back out of them, right? And to say that's theirs. I can, I can understand those emotions and I can live it with them. However, I can, I can remove myself from it. And you add that layer for compassion, which is I can understand those emotions but, and I can fix it or I can do something about it for them. Um, and, and, and to have vicarious trauma or secondary trauma means you're so inundated with it through interviewing, obser- observing it, um, looking at photographs of it, um, watching accident scenes or even like an accident reconstruction of it, living it to such an extent that you lose that thread that it's not yours. And, and so therefore, the, the traumatic symptoms that we talked about, all those different ones, almost as infectious towards that helping professional, be it a lawyer or a doctor or a counselor, whoever, they are so inundated with that material that they, that, that they lose the ability to kind of say, that's not mine. Is that? Yes. I mean, that's So using a, a current medical condition, that I, I think of like, if I have a mask on and I'm interacting with someone with COVID, mm-hmm. there's a pretty good chance that that's the only interaction I have that I probably am not going to get it. Mm -hmm. But if I have 10 people that I work with today that all have that COVID, that there's a a much higher likelihood that I might get that. And so uh, to some degree, you know, if we only have one really hard case, our ego defenses, Freud used to talk about these ego, this ego energy or ego Mm -hmm. defenses that we have against these bad things gets exhausted the more we work with it. And so if we only have one case, then we usually have enough ego energy and, and boundaries to say, wow, that's really sad. I really care about them. I hope we can work that out. But if we have 10 of them, mm-hmm. or if your caseload is 100 and you have 20 of them, then the issue of burnout starts to come into play and exhaustion. And that's part of that continuum of them being one in the same and but different. And so... Um, so what are the, what are, I mean, what are the, what is the difference between secondary trauma symptoms and, and primary trauma symptoms? Are there any differences? Well, I mean, I think um, trauma, uh, primary trauma symptoms really, is, so we didn't really talk about the idea that there's kind of post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm-hmm. And then there's what we would call developmental trauma. And one is a big, what we call big T event a big trauma event or a shock event happens in our lives that is so overwhelming to our coping strategies and so overwhelming to our limbic system Mm -hmm. um, and our coping abilities that we experience those symptoms that we've talked about on a regular basis. And it really is debilitating in our lives or has the potential to be. With secondary trauma, we often see it um, um, more as an infectious process where it kind of starts to impact us. And then um, um, Carla Joinson, the person who coined the term, once said that we're the last people to have to know that we have it because it just begins to impact our day-to-day mm-hmm. interaction with people. But the people who work with us say, hey, Pat, what's, what's going on? You're, you seem different. Mm-hmm. And so we have the same issues. Um, I think about medical errors or forgetting to make calls and, mm-hmm. and then you get home and you think, oh man, I'm supposed to, you begin to relax mm-hmm. and the, work, the stress of the day is over, all the blood flows back into your prefrontal cortex and you go, oh my gosh, I was supposed to call that family today and it's mm-hmm. critical that I did that. And so we begin to see memory problems in hospitals. We would see like medical errors mm-hmm. begin to happen. Um, 
um, or it's like a like the ter- like almost like um I, I call it like Tourette stress, which is where you're just driving in your car home from work and you forget about that one email you were supposed to send and you kind of go crap, you know, out loud. It's that that's that. It, you know, it's always there. It's always present and, and as you start to calm then you think of that one thing you didn't do and it's right back into it as the more anxious we are the the blood flow begins to flow out of the prefrontal cortex into the limbic system to sort of protect us as we move into fight or flight and so we um as the prefrontal cortex sort of deactivates so does our ability to memorize and to recall things that we should be able to recall on a regular basis. And that's, in my mind, why I remember the phone calls I was supposed to make once I get home because once I calm down. To, once I start to calm down, Interesting. I'm not in that state anymore. Yep. And then, um, you know, the avoidance mm-hmm. uh, for, for clients and for primary trauma, it's avoidance of um, people, places, things that remind them of the trauma. Mm-hmm. And so for people with compassion fatigue, their avoidance may be that they're so tired from a long day at work that they tend to start to withdraw and not interact with their partner at home. Mm-hmm. Or they, uh, I just need some quiet time. Or they skip the workout, you know, they skip the workout because they're tired. Well, that's the first thing that goes away is exercise that we generally do to feel better. Mm-hmm. Uh, we kind of uh, are short with the kids. Mm-hmm. Um, we, um, uh, nurses would, I used to do a lot of work with nurses and they would say, well, I used to dance. I used to run. I used to, you know, go out with my friends. And I say, well, what do you do now? And they say, I watch Ellen. Mm-hmm. I mean, when I get home, I'm so exhausted. I can't make myself do those things. Mm-hmm. And um, being in intimate relationships and having kids and families takes a lot of energy, as, as you know, with two little ones. Mm-hmm. That, that idea that, uh, you know, if you're you got- preoccupied and you're exhausted, you got to put a new, you got to put a different hat on when you leave the office, you put the dad hat on and you take the attorney hat off. And it sounds as though the more secondary trauma you have, and we're going to talk in a second about burnout and how that um, makes you more susceptible to secondary trauma. It's harder to do that. It's harder to take that hat off and say, it's dad, it's dad time. Um, so burnout, um, again, one and the same to a different, <clears throat> it's like a, um, I, I like I like this um, the general I believe it's a gentleman named Kotler mm-hmm. who coined the phrase rust out that is really it's just not really burnout burnout makes it seem like it happens immediately and it's this big flame and then you burn out it's more like rusting from the inside out and it's because it's it's it, you know it's long term exposure to extreme demanding situations um, that lead to exhaustion of all of all your abilities physically mentally emotionally and so the burnout which is a term coined and used all the time in probably every profession but i know in the legal profession everyone maybe has never heard of compassion fatigue never heard of trauma-informed legal practice guaranteed they've said the word burnout right a burnout or that guy's burnout right and and that is obviously a real thing um but it's really just the 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 toll the the global personal whole um, um toll taken by by just being in really stressful situations all the time. Yeah, it, it's there. There are a lot of things that can trigger it, and some of those are like how um, managers manage, how much uh, autonomy someone has, how much say someone has, um, how much support they have. Um, you know, we we in the counseling world, in the mental health world, kind of see supervision as a way of self care, mm-hmm. like the time I spend with young counselors, helping them with cases. And, and so we kind of look at three different kinds of supervision. One is administrative, and that is, are they following the rules? Are they ethical? And one is clinical supervision, like what skills do they need to learn as a counselor? And the, the third is what we call restorative supervision. How are they doing personally? Mm-hmm. Are they thinking about leaving the firm? Like is it, well, I mean, think of, the, think of the cost and the numbers of people who leave, you know, we're going to talk about that next time. That's a, Yeah, that's definitely, you know, once we get into like organizational stress, talking about the amount of attorneys that are jumping ship and leaving, either leaving mm-hmm. the firm or leaving the profession. And obviously burnout and, and secondary trauma combined into compassion fatigue is a, 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 
I mean, we believe a pretty huge component that may not be looked at quite as much as, as, uh, as other reasons are. So, I mean, lack of control. I think I got this from, from a, from one of, one of something you had done, but it's like lack of control for burnout in the work environment, poor communication, lack of collaboration and or too much collaboration with management. So like micromanagement, overload of work, too much change, unclear requirements and insufficient reward, right? You did all that work. You didn't see any positive reinforcement. Um, and, and so you're, you're tired and you're less, so you're less likely to do, do that same requirement again or, or have any interest in doing that. And then what I think is really interesting is dimensions of burnout, which are disillusionment, exhaustion, and cynicism. And I think every attorney has probably experienced all three of those. Why am I doing this, right? If I feel this way, and, and if an attorney is really in the throes of, of compassion fatigue, of secondary trauma, they probably ask themselves that. Why am I doing, I'm going to go do something else, right? Because um, why am I doing this to myself? That's the disillusionment. You lose the, you lose the point of why you went to law school to, to help people in the first place. And not because you'd have lost the interest in helping people. It's because you've lost the ability to, as you said, those ego defenses to maintain your, your borders of, of self. And then exhaustion, clear, clearly. And, and then cynicism, sarcasm, um, kind of s snapping, you know. So the best definition of, of, of um, not sarcasm, but um, God, my mind just went blank. But Cynicism? Cynicism is thinly disguised contempt. Hmm. And how often um, I hear counselors who are exhausted and burned out, they need a vacation, Talk mm -hmm. about their clients in almost contemptuous ways, mm -hmm. meaning they they're, uh, they're unmotivated. They don't, mm -hmm. you know, I'm working harder than they are. But I, I like you've told me stories, and and you can go into this way better than I can. But so if if um, hyper vigilance, so think of Maslow's hierarchy of need. Yeah. Everyone in this who's watching this is. Taking, you know, got, you got your BA. Psych, it's it's like 101 class. Psych 101. Right. And at the very bottom of that pyramid is safety and security. Yeah. And at the top is self-actualization. And so there's all these things that if I'm not safe and I'm not secure, mm -hmm. or my family isn't safe and secure, then I'm going to be in a fight-flight response. Right. All the time. I'm going right. to be hyper-vigilant. Yep. And so if I have a car accident, or a work-related accident, and um, I need money now, mm -hmm. but the legal process takes six months to a year to get that check. Mm -hmm. And you've, as an attorney, told me, okay, look, th this is a slow process. Mm -hmm. um, I will let you know when we know something new. If my family isn't, I can't put food on the table, and I'm beginning to panic, who's the first person I'm going to call in my hyper vigilant kind of state, I'm going to Correct. call you. Yeah, and and, and, and it's unacceptable to hear it's going to take time. And that would be a lot. In I did a lot of workers' compensation cases, and when a work comp case is denied, more than likely, benef all benefits are denied, including wage loss. And so, in that situation, it would be a good example of that. Is if a denied claim with no wages coming in and no ability to put food on the table. Um, that is, a, that is a prime time for that Maslow hierarchy did not be met on level one, which is safety, uh, you know, and, and, you know, and so, yeah, that, that would lead into that hypervigilance and that, you know, uh, aggression and um, um, going back to distorted blame of, of others. And, and yeah, it can, it can make for a tough, it can make for, for a tough um, time period. But what I think is really interesting is, again, that's, that, there's nothing that can be done about that. That's how the legal system works, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, a, that's, a, that's just the same interaction as attorneys have had with their clients for, since the dawn of, of the legal process. But what we're trying to do is shed light on, if you can be informed on what trauma looks like, you will have a different understanding of why your client is feeling that way and maybe why you're having a hard time um, with empathy because maybe you are burnt out and you need to focus on some of the, the, the tools that we'll talk about, about self-care to be able to realign and say, I'm in this profession to help people. This person is traumatized. 
maybe I'm at this, you know, at that point with the work comp situation, maybe in more ways than one, right? The, the injury, but then also now the lack of being able to put food on the table and to say, we have to look at this from a different perspective and the more informed you can be on the trauma process on, on how it, it manifests, not only in your clients, but also in you, that changes the outlook on that tough, tough aspect of being a lawyer, mm-hmm. right? I mean, big time. So let's take that a step further. And let's just say people don't recognize that that's a trauma response. And they've been sort of uh, yelled at by this client mm-hmm. four or five times. It's, it feels powerless because I really want to help you, but I know you blame me for not being able to do this, mm-hmm. but I am doing everything I can do and they don't want to hear it. Mm-hmm. And so the, the fifth time they call, the paralegal calls you and says, hey, it's Mr. Barnes on the phone. <laughs> and you think, what? Oh, my God. Yeah. I just can't talk to this guy right now. Okay. I, I'm not, I don't have the head space to be able to do that right this second. And that, that's, that is, that is a, in effect, burnout. Yeah. That, that's like, in effect, the avoidance Mm-hmm. of those really important things mm-hmm. that are symptoms of like that secondary trauma or symptoms, maybe symptoms of burning. And then when you say to the paralegal, I'm not talking to him, mm-hmm. just put it through to my phone. And she says, or he says, you know, they're going to be upset. Mm-hmm. Do we now have the potential for conflict within the team? Absolutely. And that, that leads right into organizational stressors, right? And, uh, and that might be what you had described as chiasmic trauma, yeah. right? Has potential. Because that, that paralegal, when they get back on the line and says, Mr. Barnes is unavailable, now, now they are going to get that, that um, the aggression and the frustrations of the client when it would have gone to you. And right. so it kind of goes down the line. And, and I think a good, t- a good way of explaining that would be, if you look at those initial primary um, trauma symptoms, one of which being a distortion of blame of others. And then you, so you try to say to the client, you know, here's the legal process and you, you know, we have to do discovery and we have to do this and we're not going to go to mediation for X amount of weeks. They may very well, if they're in the middle of a traumatic, you know, having traumatic symptoms, they may not be hearing that or not willing to hear that. And so you have this long conversation with them where you go, I told them everything that I, every, everything that's going to happen yesterday. And they're calling again today. They're, that goes back to being trauma informed. They're calling again because there's a good chance those trauma symptoms block them from being able to maybe uh, understand it quite the way you wanted them to understand it in that, in that long conversation you had with them. And so if you could take a deep breath, go into your trauma informed legal practice and understand why you are way more likely to pick that phone up again, practice empathy and compassion and be there for your client. Right. Mm -hmm. And understand I may be feeling burnout, but what's going to happen is a lot worse if I don't take that phone call or if I do start practicing avoidance behavior. So it it all, I think once we get through kind of all these chats, we can kind of say, and, and that's why it's one big giant infinity symbol, right? Is it's all one. And so we we need to we need to we need to talk about compassion fatigue um, as a whole. I think we've covered a lot of it, but essentially, again, it's the combination of secondary trauma or vicarious trauma and burnout, and those kind of cla- you know combine into one big term of compassion fatigue, which um, is kind of the depletion, right? It is the the depletion of physical, emotional, spiritual self, um, and it comes from caring deeply practicing in a stressful environment. And, uh, and so, you know, that's what Lombardo and, and Iyer, am I saying that right? Iyer? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And that's kind of, they, they coined that, that working definition as I understand it. Right. Mm-hmm. And the symptoms that I have here, I, I think these are again from, from you, um, anxiety, intrusive thoughts, exhaustion, increased awareness of personal and family vulnerability, which, is something probably attorneys start to tar- start to feel after a long time, which is um, when you see bad things happen to your clients all the time, bad rear end collisions, bad T-bones that are unavoidable, um, family law. You know, I, I keep saying that because that's what I do. So that's what I know best on the job injuries, um, 
but from a family law or from a criminal perspective, terrible situations, you cannot help but to go home and start to think any one of those things could happen to my family. And so that hypervigilance that your clients are experiencing from the primary trauma symptoms you're experiencing at home, being hypervigilant to make sure those things don't happen at your house, right? That when you're driving, you're looking in your rearview mirror and, and praying nobody comes and slams into you because they're on their phone or runs a red light and T-bones your family. Those are all hypervigilant, um, you know, uh, that, that whole um, increased awareness of danger, right? Yeah, if it can happen to them, it can happen to us. Exactly, you know? right. And that shield or that um, kind of false defensive belief that that happens to other people not to us right suddenly goes away yep um, rather than playing with our kids we're thinking about all the work we need to do tomorrow of stuff we forgot to do um, uh, so it's really interesting other symptoms are physical like headaches uh, gastrointestinal problems mm -hmm. high blood pressure weight gain um, a lot of tension, muscle tension, injuries, low back stuff. Uh, a really common one is sleep disturbances. Mm -hmm. People waking up in the middle of the night. Uh, it's not unusual for counselors to um, kind of have a dream or a, a, a kind of a thought at night about their client. Um, and of course, when you're referring to counselors, you mean like therapists. therapists of course, yes. we're also called counselors, and so I'm trying to, I'm trying to remember if you're talking about attorneys or if you're talking about your your profession. But I guess it's both one and the same, right? They're interchangeable. Um, Addiction. That's the other piece. Is people start drinking more. Uh, mm -hmm. People go to their physician and say, "Hey, um, what about some like benzos? You know, benzodiazepines, some Xanax for my anxiety." And, and that over the course of time, that leads to increased. So the co-occurrence of trauma and um, addiction, whether it's chemical dependency, shopping, gambling, sex, uh, affairs, there's all kinds of things that, that play out in that process. Um, we see that all the time in the treatment world uh, when we treat lawyers. That's a big, big thing. Mm -hmm. So physicians, lawyers, other professionals as well. And then I think these are interesting, but avoidance or dread of working with certain clients, reduced ability to feel empathy towards clients or their families. Um, I think those are probably, if attorneys were honest and took an inventory, are two things that they have experienced, especially in times of high stress. Um, to say kind of that, that uh, example we just gave, you know, I just don't have it in me to talk to that client right now. What's the snowball effect of that? And how does that then keep the, the infinity symbol of, of stress and trauma going, right? Um, well, yeah, it's interesting. And, and you think about, you know, what's, a, what's one really surefire way to not have to deal with this every day? And that is to become cynical, to become... Um, you know, uh, to not care as much. Mm -hmm. And um, I've placed students in mental health centers with these older grizzled professionals who were pretty cynical and like mm -hmm. the young counselors. And, I, and this is important, I think, in law too, I would have to say, I would guess, is someone comes out of law school, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, mm -hmm. positive, we're going to change the world, we're going to do positive things. And then they get in the firm and find that there's a lot of people who are kind of have a compassion fatigue, maybe don't have the compassion, um, maybe aren't as enthusiastic as they had kind of hoped they would be. And what does that do to job satisfaction? And what does that do to the energy of the new employee? Mm -hmm. That's why turnover so. Yeah. I mean, is that, do you think that, and, and it yeah. happens. It happens in counseling centers. Yeah, the, 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 you know, the grizzled attorney that is, you know, I've been doing this too long. Um, you know, I'm too, too old for this. Um, you know, and, and kind of that, that new attorney that doesn't have a, that yet kind of sees that and maybe sees, feels that cynicism more than the older attorney knows, right? Yeah. I, I, I mean, I have to assume that that, has the potential in your world as much as it does in our world. And how much of those physical symptoms you mentioned, like headaches, digestive problems, muscle tension, um, 
fatigue, cardiac symptoms, low back symptoms, how much of that is really just not doing the self care and that eating poorly, you know, eating lunch out as opposed to bringing lunch because you just don't have it in you to, to, to prep a, a lunch, you know, or, um, you know, not wanting to cook when you get home, not wanting to work out. Um, I have to assume those are, those are where those come from or to some extent come from that, right? Well, and I think the way society is with two, you know, profession, professional families and, you know, that a lot of, um, a lot of that uh, kind of falls by the wayside, the more exhausted we are. Mm-hmm. the more um, we're, you know, well, the more we sit at the desk because we think that we can overcome how we feel by get by working harder and doing more. And so you sit at the desk longer and your back starts to hurt. Um, you know, those are kind of those physical manifestations of, of it. So, yeah. I mean, we're going to get, you know, as we go further into these talks, we're going to talk more about each one of these in more detail and, and, and kind of, especially how they affect an organization and, and get into that. But so what, and we're going to do a whole, a whole chat about self-care and what can we do about it? But let's kind of just talk briefly for, for today's purposes, you know, what, you know, we've talked a lot about what not to do, right. To become cynical and lose that empathy and not see things through the eyes of your client and understand what your client's going through. What, what can you do when you start to feel, feel these symptoms? I know you're the last one to know, like you said, Everyone else notices that you're having problems except for you until you do. Um, what, you know, what do you do? Well, when an organization can begin to, um, you know, accept that this is – so when I'm working with organizations on this, I generally have the CEO um, or the head, head of the organization send out a letter to all of their employees that say, we understand that our job is difficult. We understand that – we work with difficult clients and we understand that compassion fatigue is real and is, has a high potential in this environment, whether it's a hospital or wherever it is. And when that happens, then it lets people um, begin to recognize or be open to saying, you know, I, maybe I'm, I don't feel like the old, my old self. Maybe I need to be able to do some things differently. And so, um, individually like eating right exercise taking time out to um for our relationships um be intimate like um really work hard on our relationships um you know get enough sleep and if we're not getting enough sleep talk to our doctor to find out there are some ways uh, there's some really good ways that uh, we'll sleep hygiene and things that we can do take our vacations so often we feel that if we're taking a vacation, we're letting, you know, our peers down mm-hmm. because they have to, someone has to pick up our job. But if we or, you feel, other, or you feel as you feel more stress being on away from the office than you do, you know, wondering how many voicemails are, are piling up, you know, you can, but, but so, being able to overcome that, that, uh, that worry, the, the American Academy of Family Physicians uh, has a do and don't list, which I think is really good and really succinct. And the do's are find someone to talk to which is huge. Be able to, uh, to download, I, you know, I call it downloading, be able to download it. Even if you're not problem solving and maybe there's what you're, what you're uh, needing to download isn't even something that can be solved. It just is one of the stressors, which we'll talk about operational stress, which is just yeah. part of the job, but at least you get to talk to about it and somebody can say, Hey, I hear you. I'm, I'm with you. I've been through that or I'm going through that too. You know, it helps. Um, understanding that this is normal because again, these are, a lot of these stressors are, are operational stressors, which we'll talk about Matthew and her, her theories that, um, you know, that essentially this is an on the job hazard, right? A hazard of the job. Um, and it's normal to feel this way. Get enough sleep. You mentioned that take time off and have interests outside of the profession, you know, and, and I, I do that, right? A lot like, this is, this is a, a passion of mine. I love after my day at work, being a lawyer, coming and researching and writing, talking with you, doing these kinds of things. Like, even though they're technically involved with the legal profession there, they are their own. You know, I like to listen to music and I like to, um, you know, write. And, and so, yeah, having, being able to take that lawyer hat off and put a different hat on and say, we're going to do this now. Um, and then of it's course it, yeah, go ahead. 
Sorry. When I was at Florida State, uh, we had a, a nursing professor who used to say, the difference between burnout and compassion fatigue is people who are burned out can't wait to leave their job. Like they're mm -hmm. always thinking about quitting. Yeah. There's, be there's a better firm somewhere. There's a, you know, I can use this degree some, somewhere else. And she said, and I thought it was really interesting. People who have compassion fatigue can't leave the job behind. Mm -hmm. And so they're the ones that sit at the desk and work harder. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones that try to give it meaning when they're struggling rather than talk to someone. Um, that mm. hold themselves to such high perfectionistic standards when it's impossible to be that. So, right. um, and, and when you take the time away to do what you just said, that's actually fighting the compassion fatigue. You're beginning to break that cycle by going and playing golf or going yep. to ride a bike or something. Well, and, I, and it sounds obvious, but if you can do that and clear your mind enough that when you do go back, you, you come in with a little more level-headedness and you come in with a little more sense of, um, you know, I don't want to say compartmentalization, but that, that you recognize there is stuff outside of, of your office and that allows you to kind of focus on what's in the office when you're in the office and maybe say, okay, I'm putting this aside and I'm going, like you said, golfing or, you know, I'm going to go paint um, or play my guitar. Yeah, I think it builds resilience uh, and I think that ego energy begins to build so we have more energy for work the next day. Right. Rather than like, oh, man, my tank is completely empty. And and so the, 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 again, the American Family of Family, American Academy of Family Physicians, their don't list is blame others, right? Which I guess is an organizational stress or trauma. Yeah. Um, look for a new job. That would be like changing the extrinsic as opposed to looking internally at the intrinsic. Well, and it's, it's, it's my situation. If I just go to this firm, I, that won't be there. But the reality is if you are feel, suffering from, vicarious trauma, secondary trauma, burnout, compassion fatigue, that's internal. And it doesn't matter what situation you put yourself in, as long as it's in the same stressful environment, it will catch up to you. It always reminds me of an old Jackson Brown song where he's saying, uh, no matter how fast I run, I can never seem to get away from me. Mm. And, and that idea of when we turn and face the struggles that we have, it, it allows us to settle in and uh, to kind of, appreciate and to cope much differently than we do when we're looking always looking down the road mm -hmm. um again these are kind of extrinsic don't buy a new car that's obviously changing the external thinking it will change your internal don't get a divorce or have an affair um complain with your colleagues and work harder and longer i think that's the most important one i can i can i can work my way out of this because the reality is if if you've been a lawyer long enough, you know that your to-do list is going to never be done. And, and as you finish your to-do list at the bottom of it is new stuff adding onto it. And so if you say, I, I just have to, I'm going to work till I'm going to stay at this desk until everything's done. Well, when you get in tomorrow, there will be a new list. And I think coming to terms with that and saying, I, I can't work harder and longer because all you're going to do is, is perpetuate that burnout, that exhaustion. And then the other ones are self medic don't don't self medicate and don't neglect yourself, which I think are both you know really good advice. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think meditation and mindfulness yep. and kind of are, are two things that yoga that we see all over society. But the research on mindfulness is remarkable in terms of reducing tra uh, traumatic stress response. The VA is having great success um, with mindfulness activities mm -hmm. uh, we use it all the time with our clients that uh, really allowed them to be present and to learn how to focus on themselves um you know uh, we tend to isolate so be with friends mm -hmm. uh, play golf go play tennis go do something with other people yeah and, uh, and receive supervision and, or consultation talk to yeah other to, to be able to say to to a uh, you know, supervising attorney, managing partner, you know, can you, can you read this? You know, I, I'm stressing over this motion. Can you read it? Can you sit in on this intake? Can you sit on this meeting with this client? Um, you know, or, or can I watch you do a cons consultation and kind of take yourself out and watch them do it? I think there's a lot of um, mindfulness that can be um, when you're watching someone else do 
maybe even something that you do all the time, like, like an intake meeting or a deposition or something, watching someone else do it allows you to kind of, I guess, be mindful of that because you're not necessarily focusing on the project. You're watching the attorney that you're, that you're, um, you know, watching do it, I guess. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, if you're not cool. focusing on the content of the deposition or that intake, you're focusing on the attorney's um, behavior and energy. It allows you to kind of go, do I do that? Do I want to do that? Do I want to do it differently? It kind of allows you to take inventory on how maybe you approach the same thing. Yeah. Absolutely. So, well, I, I think, um, you know, that those are, those are the building blocks, right? So we got primary trauma, secondary vicarious trauma, burnout, compassion fatigue. Those are vital to understand to some level and degree to be able to be mindful and to be able to be trauma informed and to know my client might be going through more than just they're a difficult client or they're, you know, they're mean when they're on the phone. They could be going through a lot more, uh, you know, than, than maybe even they realize from a tra trauma perspective. And I think being informed and understanding that will take your practice light years ahead of wherever it is if you're not doing that currently. So I will reiterate, and I'm sure you would, let me you go ahead and get the last word on that. Well, I was just going to say, you know, we could teach a whole academic course, and I have at, at universities on, on trauma. So in an hour, we can't cover all those bases. And so we'll be adding pieces to discuss as we're kind of going through. But yep. if, if people are really interested in getting resources, yeah. if you email us, we can, yeah. we can send you... Um, I have a whole um, bibliography for compassion fatigue kinds of things. Yeah, because I, I mean, we, we cited a lot of, of, of work in here, but there's a lot more out there, and we'll talk on a lot of that um, in the next couple of sessions. But, but yeah, if people want to read more, for sure, we can, we can help you get, get to links to other stuff or read the stuff that we're writing. Um, but I, I really just invite people in the profession to, to reach out and talk about this. Maybe you totally disagree with me. And think I don't think you I don't think you're you're on to anything here and I here's why I'd love to to, to to hear it but but I think that I think that we are and I think um, I think that uh, it's it's important for the profession to kind of evolve and move forward with with it and and to really take empathy and and uh, caring for your clients to the next level and so I you know I invite people to just start the conversation with us um, and keep it going so ne next time um, we're going to get into the, I keep saying it, the infinity symbol, that twisted O um, in the organizational stress and operational stress. And I think that'll be really interesting. And I think it's important that these, these building blocks that we talked about today are, you know, kind of in the fourth, forefront of people's minds talking about those other, those other um, categories. Yeah, I agree. Looking, I, I'm looking forward to it. This is going to yeah. be interesting. All right. Well, till till next time. Um, and you want to? Would you where where would you want people to email you? Do you want them just get a hold of you like on LinkedIn? Message you on LinkedIn or? Um, um, you can certainly message me on LinkedIn, Michael F. Barnes, uh, PhD. Um, but uh, my email address is Mike dot Barnes at Foundry uh, F O U N D R Y Steamboat in Steamboat Springs, Colorado dot com. And um, you know, I'm more than happy to send you stuff or you can go to my website at drmikebarnes.com to find those articles. And Perfect. Those, yeah. Those and I'm, I'm, on, I'm on all the, the social media sites and LinkedIn is a good way to get a hold of me, Patrick Barnes. Um, but yeah, we, you know, we, we look forward to, to, to keep this going and uh, I've enjoyed talking with you, dad, Dr. Dad. Yeah. As always. <laughs> Talk to you later. Okay. See you later. Bye.